Thank you. So I'll be talking about writing an interpreter in Python itself from scratch. So let's get rid of the hard question first. Uh, how to distinguish between the different prompts during the demo, because we're, we have Python and we're writing Python in it, so we're not going to know where we are. So I'm going to use IPython for the regular Python interpreter. So if you see in bracket number bracket, that means we're in the regular Python interpreter. And if you see p greater greater than, then we are in, the, uh, in our interpreter, the one we're trying to write. OK, so then let me uh, clarify a bit what I mean by from scratch. So we're not going to use exec eval. Of course, that would be too easy, or uh, even the AST module for interpreting. And uh, we're not going to use any of the existing uh, internal libraries or external tools for parsing either. Uh, actually, but we are going to use uh, Python strings, Python lists, and all the functions associated with those. So let me just show you uh, what the interpreter looks like now so we get a better idea. So I'm Oh, you can't hear me? Can you hear me now? <laughs> OK, so we're in the interpreter here. So let's try some simple things, uh, x equals 3. And then maybe print x. So we're in Python 2 here. You print, I don't need parentheses. Um, and oh, we got an error. What a terrible way to start a demo. Of course, this is deliberate. Uh, so also, now you can distinguish between when we are in one interpreter and the other, right? So we had p greater than here, and here I have in. So let me quit this and restart the same thing. And now what I'm going to do is, as a first line, I'm going to write simport, simple AST. So simport works more or less like import. Uh, but I'm going to explain how that works slightly later on. So now if I do the same demo, so print x, I don't get an error, and it prints 3 as expected. Uh, the command something is just for debugging. Let me move that a bit higher. OK, and to get an idea of the scope uh, of what the interpreter can do, let me just uh, compute the squares of uh, all odd numbers between 1 and 5 and see that it gives me the right result, 1925 one here. OK, uh, so uh, also for those of you uh, for whom writing a Python interpreter is too boring, you can try to figure out before the second half of the talk uh, why it gave me an error if I didn't run that first line and why it did not give me an error afterwards. I mean, it's not just a if check that says, if you didn't run this magical thing, then give a deliberate error. OK, so uh, we want to write a Python interpreter. And uh, so the user is going to write something in the file like commands in a file or uh, in the repo, as we've seen here. So something like x equals f of 3. But we don't want to treat this uh, as a string all the time, although in theory it would be possible. So the fir uh, first thing we usually want to do is just turn this thing into a data structure uh, that's more malleable for uh, execution. So And that's an abstract syntax tree, which we have on the bottom left there. So, uh, so for this statement, we have as a root, a regular assignment node, and with the first child, which is a name node with the value x. The second child is a call node, which itself has two children, a name node f, and an argument list node uh, arg list with a single argument number three. Right, so an abstract syntax tree is just a tree like this, where each node has some kind of name, like regular assign, call, arg list, and so on. And uh, if you see it in the console during the demo, you're going to see what's on the right, right? So this is the textual representation of the same tree on the left we have there. OK, so to write our interpreter, we're going to have two steps. So the first step is parting. We're going to turn uh, Python source code into an abstract syntax tree, as we've just seen. And in the second step, we're going to take this abstract syntax tree and uh, run it, uh, so run the corresponding program. OK, so let's start with the first step, parsing. Uh, so, of course, I'm only going to give glimpses of this because there's many parts uh, to this interpreter. So, uh, for parsing, right, so that's when we want to transform text into the abstract syntax tree. So, uh, the core of it is uh, an algorithm which takes as first input a description of a language. So, in this case, Python. I'll come to that. Uh, so, I'll describe that in a bit more detail in a bit. And a second input, some piece of text, right, which we think of as the source code, and which gives us uh, either an abstract syntax tree or a syntax error if this, second, uh, if this second input string didn't match the grammar which was given there. OK, so I'm going to call this a grammar matcher. And we see a black box here, because today I won't have time uh, to go into detail of how that's going to work. OK, and usually 
Uh, so for the black box that I'm not going to talk about, uh, this step involves you know, multiple sub-steps, like tokenizing, lexing, parsing, and so on. But actually, uh, in this implementation, we'll just have one step so uh, to go from these two inputs to the output we want. So let me talk a bit about the grammar. So actually, uh, the grammar we have to give uh, as first input is also going to be represented as an abstract syntax tree. It's just an abstract syntax tree for describing some language. Uh, it also usually has a textual representation, which can be turned into this. Right, so uh, the main function we're going to use for parsing is this. So it takes an abstract syntax tree, a uh, piece of text, and turn it into the abstract syntax tree of the second input. Okay, so uh, maybe it, it's easier. So normally this is sort of the textual representation of the grammar, which I'm not going to go into detail about. Uh, but this is the piece of text we're going to start off with. So let me just show you uh, how the parsing works. So let me exit it here. So I'm going to run the first few lines uh, of the demo we've seen earlier. So let's import some stuff from our library. And here I'm defining a function, a match function, which corresponds to that black box we've seen. Uh, I'm defining it here just so that it looks more like what was already on the slide. Oops. So uh, here I have a piece of text I've imported. Right, it's like about 20 lines, and it's going to describe uh, a first language that we're going to turn into a tree. Okay, so, and we have some kind of start tree. Uh, so I'm not going to show you what this is. And now the first step is uh, we're going to match, right? So this is the black box we have here. The first input is this start tree, which I'm not going to show you yet. And the second input is this grammar, which is just this piece of text. And now match tree should be a tree which corresponds to this piece of text. So let's see what's in there. Right, so now we have an abstract syntax tree, as I've shown earlier, except that this is a tree describing a language instead of a tree describing a Python program. Right? And so one interesting thing here is now I'm going to show you what was in start tree, right, which was imported. And it looks exactly the same. In fact, if you check this, start tree w equals match tree, they're actually exactly equal. Right? So uh, the only information contained in start tree is that piece of text but uh, in a tree form. Okay, so this was unnecessary because we already had star tree. We could have just used that. So I'm going to, uh, in the second step, I'm going to pass, so uh, give as first input the match tree we got in the first step, and as second input, uh, the grammar we had, so the piece of text we had, plus some extra stuff. So I can show you what that is, but it's not, oops. But it's not too important. Okay. And as third step, we're going to take what we had from the second step and give it as first input. And then as second input, we're going to have uh, something that actually describes the Python programming language. So let me show you uh, what that piece of text is. Okay, so this is, again, you know, uh, because Python is still fairly complicated uh, as a language. So we have lots of uh, things in this piece of text. Actually, something similar is uh, in the C Python uh, source. So uh, you can see something uh, very similar in there. So maybe let me just focus on a few things. So here we have file input, right? So if you want to parse a file and it just says, well, what's a file input? It's just either an empty line or some indent followed by a statement and repeated many times. The star is, uh, is some kind of uh, regular expression repetition star. And a statement is just a compound statement or a simple statement. A simple statement is just small statements separated by semicolons. And a small statement is either a print statement, a delete statement, a pass statement, and so on. And uh, let's just take a look at, so a pass statement is just a, the string pass followed by nothing. A delete statement is just a string delete followed by uh, some spaces, followed by a list, list of expressions, and so on. Right, so you have this entire string, which is uh, going to describe the Python programming language. And now we have the string in the tree form in match tree three. Okay, so let's actually try to parse some Python program. So again, this is, uh, we're going to use a slightly more advanced black box, although we could have used this one uh, the entire way instead of match. And we're going to try to parse this file. 
And to parse it, well, we actually just do exactly the same thing. So we run match. And as first input, we give it the tree describing the Python programming language. And as second input, we give it the text, which is the content of the file. And now if we look at this file, oops, yeah. So it's uh, what you expect from a Python program, right? So we have regular assign as in the example we had in the very beginning. Okay. So that's all I'm going to talk about uh, for the parsing, parsing part. But uh, I should mention that so the black box isn't that complicated. Actually, the entire thing isn't that complicated. So uh, if uh, we could just take uh, everything in the parsing library and put it into a file which is about 510 lines of Python, and that file is able to parse itself. So let me maybe show you that now. So this is the file, single file. Right, so 508 lines. Uh, this is actually this part you don't need to read. This is sort of like the start tree, which, and this is all the strings we had in there. And in the beginning, you actually have, you know, uh, the semantics of how, like, what to do with each of these trees, right? Like the match function, which was in there. Okay, uh, so let me just run it. See that. Well, Right, so here it parsed uh, itself, and it gave itself as an abstract syntax tree, uh, just to show that parsing worked. Right, so this is, you know, what we had at the very end here. Oops. There we go. So this looks like that. Okay, and uh, the bootstrapping part, so the part where we started, that fits in about 120 lines. Uh, maybe a few things that were interesting. So the thing which allows us to do this in a single step instead of multiple steps is the fact that we're using a parser expression grammar instead of uh, one of the other grammars. And uh, the other thing which is interesting is that this parser is a parser interpreter in some sense. It's not a parser generator, right? We're just making abstract syntax trees, but we're never generating Python code for parsing the next step. Okay, so that's all I'm going to say. Uh, about the parsing part, so if you get lost, you can wake up again. And I'm going to talk about running now. So let's assume that uh, if the user types some text, we can have it in some kind of tree, which is representative of the program, and now we just want to run it. Okay, so did anybody think about uh, that simport puzzle at the beginning? So why did it give an error if I didn't run simport, which runs more or less like import? And uh, why it did not give an error if I did that? OK, so let me give the answer to that right now. Uh, so simpleast.py, right? So if you were trying to import simpleast, then it would look for this file. Uh, it contains the fol following function definition. So it defines a function which is called print statement, which takes a single argument and then uh, does the right thing to print it con its content. So what happened here is actually uh, that some of the semantics for the abstract syntax nodes, for, so for how we're supposed to run it, they're not included in the core of the running part of the interpreter. They're actually included in the library. So since they're in the library, if you don't import them, uh, the interpreter doesn't know what to do with them. Right? So they're actually going to be run uh, through our interpreter instead of being hard-coded into the interpreter. Uh, OK, so let's see another example. So this was print statement. right? So uh, let's look at end test, right? So if you have some if you're writing some condition and some other condition, uh, how are we supposed to run this? Well, there's a function defined in there which is called end test, which takes two parameters, right? So the first argument, so which we think about as the first argument and the second argument, but actually uh, the argument it receives are uh, the children in the abstract syntax tree, <coughs> right? And so this one, it just if the first argument evaluates to true. And then uh, we try to evaluate the second argument. And if that's evaluated true, we return true. And otherwise, we return false. Right? So this corresponds uh, to our run of end. No. OK. So let me, uh, now that we've seen two examples, let me go into uh, the details of how the main loop. So here's a slightly simplified version of how the running part of the interpreter works in its main loop. So it initializes. Uh, the scope at first, so some environment with your globals in there. Uh, then it initializes the stack with a single element in there, right? A single frame, <coughs> which just contains the root of the file we are trying to run. And then it just goes into this while loop. 
So it looks at the top of the stack, and it looks at the name of the node at the top of the stack. If it's in some module called boot, then it just calls that function in boot, passing a star node, so passing the children of that node as arguments to that function. Uh, otherwise, it looks in simple AST. And so if there is a module called simple AST and uh, there is a function corresponding to the node's name, then it just calls that function and passes the children. And otherwise, it looks into the built-in, so the thing's hard-coded into the interpreter. And if it finds that, then it calls that function and passes the children of the node. And otherwise, that's an error. So that's the first error we've seen. OK, so let's look at. OK, so let's look at some more examples. Uh, so if statement. So this is normally something you would need hard-coded in, but actually uh, we're going to be able to get away with having it in the library instead of in the core of the running interpreter. So uh, an if statement just has a list of pairs of conditions and blocks. And if uh, so we go through all these conditions and blocks in order. And if a condition evaluates true, then we evaluate the block and return it. Oh, and by the way, evaluate uh, as a function with respect to this main loop, all it does is just adds that node at the top of the stack. It doesn't really do anything else. Uh, and then the main loop will take care of evaluating as expected. Uh, OK, so let's take, look at, take a look at for statement. So for statement, well, there's an index variable, some iterable, and then the block we want to execute, and maybe some kind of else block uh, in some cases when we want to execute a block of code uh, if we didn't break from the loop. And so uh, the loop just works this way. So evaluate the iterable, take an iterator of it, right, iterator of it. So this gives you an iterator. And then run the following indefinitely. So try to assign the next uh, value of the iterator to the index var variable. So here we can't do index var equals iterator dot next because that would assign the value uh, of iterator dot next in the wrong scope. It would assign it in the scope of the first statement function, whereas we want it in the function which calls it. And uh, if we, we do this until we get a, so sorry, uh, we assign uh, iterator dot next to the index variable, and then we just run the block, evaluate block at the bottom. And we do this until we get a stop iteration, right? which means iterator.next uh, ran out of values here. And then we just check, uh, run the else block, if there was one, and then return. Okay. And so let's look at one more example. So try statement. Well, try statement is just a block, and then a bunch of exceptions, right? So some list of, uh, of exceptions we're looking for, and the block to run uh, if we catch that exception. So it just works like this. Uh, evaluate the block. And if we catch some kind of exception, well, I'll, let's put it in a variable called error. And then uh, just check it against each of the clauses uh, that the uh, that uh, try statement is trying to check against. And if we find one, then just evaluate that exception block and return and stop checking for the others. And otherwise, just keep going. OK, so does anybody notice any problems with the last three definitions we have seen here? Uh, so if we have this thing in the library, uh, what's going to happen is that uh, this is going to loop indefinitely. Because when we translate this function into an abstract syntax tree, so the first thing in this function is going to be a try statement node. And if we think about our loop, for that try statement node, well, it's going to look in simple ST for a function called try statement, and it's going to call it with its children. But that's this function. So it's going to call itself, and then it's going to call itself. So it's never actually going to run anything. Right? So the call graph, actually, this was a problem with if statement also. right? So our definition of if statement included an if. And so if we include it in the library, it's just going to call itself there which is, and loop indefinitely. So that's not what we want. right? The call graph looks like this. Try statement calls itself. If statement calls itself. For statement calls both of the two others, which calls it back. So that's going to also loop indefinitely. So it seems we are a bit in a bind, uh, in a bit of a bind here, right? So we're, what we are actually going to do is um, we are. So one way would be just to put all of this uh, coded into the interpreter, right? So if you, this was run in C Python, it would be okay because the try statement inside would be run in C Python. Uh, but then actually evaluate is going to be hard to implement because currently evaluate just adds uh, the node we put 
uh, there at the top of the stack. And then what it's supposed to do is run a few iterations of the main loop. And then when it's done, we extract the uh, return value and do something with that. So if we have a Python function inside the interpreter there, then when we run evaluate, we have to exit that function. And then when evaluate is done after a few iterations of the main loop, we have to come back. So we have to do some fancy state tracking. Uh, even if we wanted to put this into the core of our interpreter. OK, so uh, what the actual solution we're going to use is the following. So uh, we're going to write three more functions, which are simpler versions of the, the three we've seen. So instead of, so the simpler version of if statement is single if statement, which is only able to handle a single block. The simpler version of for statement is simple for statement, which is only able to handle iterators which are indexable. And the simpler version of try statement is try statement error, which only handles, uh, so only does the second part when an exception happens. So the first part, we're actually going to run it uh, inside the core. And actually, there was also a while true there. So we'll also have a simpler version of while, which is only able to do while true. So this is what a uh, single if looks like. So it's only able to take one condition and one block. And then it evaluates the condition, uh, turns it into a Boolean, checks. Uh, so we built a dictionary here such that if that Boolean is true, then we'll evaluate the block that was passed here. Uh, so this is some kind of uh, a bit of a small talk inspired function. And if it, it was false, then it just evaluates a, blo a block which contains a single pass statement, which basically just does nothing, right? So that's the definition of single if. Uh, here's the definition of simple for, right? So simple for uh, takes, so it takes no else block. It still takes an index var, an iterable, and a block. And uh, here we assume that the iterable is indexable. So then we can have an index variable which starts at zero. We evaluate the iterable, evaluate its length, and then do the assignments we had before. Uh, evaluate the block, just increment the index, and then check if we have attained the length, and in that case, uh, just return from this function, right? Because that should be the end of the loop. Okay. And try statement error is more or less the same thing as we had uh, in try statement, right? So the last few lines of try statement, that stays the same. There's no problem here. Uh, but here you can see that it's calling uh, simple for instead of for, right? There's no simple for statement in Python normally. And uh, we should also write single if instead of if on this third line here. But actually, uh, we'll just uh, delegate that to the parser. So when the parser sees that an if statement only has a single block, it's going to put a single if abstract syntax tree node instead of uh, an, an if statement abstract syntax, no syntax node. OK, so here's the uh, new call graph again. right? So by doing this, uh, we're able to put all of these things in the library instead of in the core of the interpreter. OK. So I want to talk about one last thing, and that's postmortem debugging. So here I have a file that I'm going to run, which is buggy. Right here, there's a typo, ii, and there's tuto, which should be total. So let me run this uh, in C Python first, so the, the Python interpreter we're used to. OK, so we got an error here as expected, right? It printed the first few iterations, and then we got an error at the first error. So uh, normally, in regular Python, what we can do uh, when we get an error is uh, oops, import PDB, so the Python debugger module. I think someone's going to talk about this later. And we can import this and run pdb.pm so, uh, for postmortem debugging. And if we run this, uh, we'll get the Python debugger uh, interpret it here, and now we can look at the values at the last error we got, right? So we can print i, print total, and if we had function calls, we could go up and down the stack so that we can evaluate expressions uh, in different uh, context. Okay, so that's uh, how postmortem debugging works uh, in Python normally. So let's see how postmortem debugging works uh, in our interpreters test. So I'm going to, oh, whoops, I uh, forgot to uncomment simple, 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 simple AST. So let's do that again. 
OK, so it, it, it prints the first few lines like regular Python, and then we got this error. It says key error because it tries to find this variable ii in scope and can't find it. So let's first see a uh, stack trace of this. Right, so here you can, uh, as a demonstration, you can also see that it alternates between going into this uh, erroneous file and this lib slash simple st. So that's what we've been talking about, right? So it's currently in the augmented assign function because it's trying to run total plus equals ii. And then you can see uh, you know, it also has a column indent instead of <coughs> line indent. OK, so let's. Uh, look at the last stack frame where we got this error. So here's the node associated with it, right? So it says name ii. And that's wrong, so let's try to fix that. Right, so the correct uh, value is i. And now what we're going to do is just continue. So now we hit the second error. But before that, it printed total, which means it passed by this line, but it didn't print all the rest of the stuff, so it really did just continue. So let's examine this one and fix it too. And continue. Right, so and now it goes along its way. And also in the last iteration, it didn't hit this bug, which we already fixed. Right, so this is something which, as far as I know, you cannot do uh, with just a regular Python debugger. OK. Uh, so. Uh, here, so just to say that you know everything I've shown today, even though I didn't show you all the details, isn't that complicated. So here's the current line count, and as I've mentioned, the first part for parsing, if you only wanted parsing, you could have just had all of that uh, in about 510 lines instead. So we, tr I tried to move as much as possible uh, into the library, uh, and of course it's not fully featured right now, but uh, maybe as a last thing to show you, uh, I can show you that it's able to run its own uh, parser in itself. So, uh, this is probably going to take some time. So, maybe let me just mention that uh, this project is looking for help. So, please talk to me uh, here. So, we're, I mean, we, by we, I mean me. I'm mainly interested in reducing the complexity uh, of everything we have here, right? So, reducing these numbers further. Uh, and also reducing the dependency on C Python and make more steps sort of self generating, right? So, you know, uh, each of these library functions, like simple if, help us make, if statement, and so on. So, have more uh, things created in steps like that. Uh, okay, so it almost started here. So, here's uh, this was just some test to see if uh, my implementation of objects worked. So, here it is, right? So, now it's trying to parse itself. So, it's matching things from the beginning. Uh, I see. So the index here, the number is just uh, the index in the input. Of course, this is going to be very slow, right? I'm running an interpreter inside another interpreter. And actually, the parser is also uh, sort of a parser interpreter instead of a parser generator. So of course, it's very slow. Uh, it's not going to end, so I'm going to just stop it here. OK, so that's all I wanted to say. Thank you. add things in multiple places in the source and then recompile every time you want to test out a change. And here, since it's all in Python, you can sort of just test it out right away, right? You don't even need to exit the interpreter in theory. Uh, but it's actually also to write something uh, else, I guess, uh, with a graphical layer uh, after this. So to make changes so that the next step is easier to write or can be write written in a more succinct and uh, natural way. Python or improvements? Sorry, for Python? So is this same thing? Uh, do you have any uh, improvements to previous version of Python? Oh, improvements. 
No, well, actually, I mean, the new statements are actually just for bootstrapping for now, right? Like simple live for uh, single single live for simple for statement. Uh, I haven't added anything. I mean, the thing I wanted to add is actually this debugging thing, and also uh, late binding. So, you know, change how class lookup works so that I can reload my class definitions so that uh, all my instances use the new definition. Uh, but I haven't added anything else in you know any particular statement but it's made so that it's easy for anybody else to add new statements oh so for the python part yes yeah, so this is i mean it's derived from the uh, python 2 grammar in the source it's at this part. So it I mean, if you look at the one in the Python source, I mean, it's of course not exactly the same thing. And also they handle indent slightly differently. Uh, but otherwise it looks more or less the same, except, you know, for things we, uh, I talked about, right? Like uh, single if, things like that, which are here, which are of course not in the normal Python interpreter. In the back. Do you intend to support all the features of Python, like generators, dictionary, uh, completion? Uh, so there's dictionaries. So uh, no. So the primary goal isn't to uh, have all the features of Python. It's really so to make it so that experimenting with languages is easier and uh, to get a shorter description of the interpreter. Right? Maybe a subset. Uh, but a subset where it's easy to add new things, right? Because uh, now that even the abstract syntax tree, uh, right? So uh, generators, for example, are not there, but if you wanted them, then uh, you could just add a definition in the library uh, at some point and then just get that. Uh, but the primary goal isn't to be fully Python compatible. So thank you, Zantao.